Lovely to see you all this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, the speakers for today, <clears throat> Maria Roshkowska and uh, Nicolas Maigret. Um, I got to know their work, uh, I think, last year in Belgium. There are a couple of artists who I think are doing some fantastic and innovative work. Um, Maria is an artist designer and, and initiator of disnovation.org or disnovation.org. Um, which is a working group with Nicola. Um, from 2010, she's con conducted work in Paris um, before working in a um, cultural design studio also in Paris. She designed and coordinated Don't Brand My Public Space, a three-year research on the issues of cities and applying branding strategies. And she also uh, worked with, um, uh, with Nicola, I believe, on uh, the Pirate Book, an anthology of media piracy. Uh, Nicola is an artist, curator and educator. He works on the internal workings of media through an exploration of these dysfunctions, um, limitations or failure thresholds which he delivers, uh, develops into immersive, ambiguous and critical art networks, uh, artworks. Uh, he in innovated disnovation.org, a working group which aims to, I love this, disrupt, pervert, and complexify the narratives on collective, on uh, technological innovation. <laughs> I just want to hand out, because it, it's one of the things that, that, that I first got aware of with them was this wonderful series of volumes called Blacklist, um, which is basically uh, a printed list of, of banned websites. Um, and, you know, first of all, I love the fact that it, it's in a series of books. Each book is, uh, I think, 666 pages long, which is the number, which is the uh, number of the beast. Um, and if you read through the books, I mean, you think it's just going to be a boring set of websites, but it's like reading the yellow pages or reading a really <laughs> telephone directory. You can learn a hell of a lot just by reading through this incredibly abstruse list. Um, so I think what they do is, you know, their work is playful, it's disruptive. And it's really, really interesting at the same time. So what they're going to do is talk about their current work today, and then they're going to segue a little bit, because they're going to be here with us for a few months. So they're, consider them a resource as well as speakers. They're going to be here with us, working with us for a few months, and they're going to describe what they're going to be working on um, over the next few months here in Irvine. So please welcome Nicola and Maria. Yeah, so uh, the, the lecture uh, will be uh, split in three parts. The, the first part will look at uh, older artworks. Uh, the second part will look at uh, projects that are more tending toward uh, curating, so where we uh, organize things or organize artworks from other people and so on. And the last part will look at uh, the research we want to conduct here. Uh, so Maya will introduce. Yeah, so I will uh, make a general introduction. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting us. And uh, so we are this innovation. We I, are based in Paris. And uh, like uh, Jeff uh, already said, uh, we intend to reveal and challenge um, the dominant ideology of innovation, technological innovation, and to circulate uh, alternative uh, narratives. So uh, we, we identify in the field of technocritics. So we make uh, different uh, uh, bodies of work, like uh, curations, um, showed up in festival and art spaces where we investigate the rhetoric of uh, technological innovation and the growing effect on, on, um, on this dominant ideology of society. Uh, we also do research, editing, and books, like the Pirate Book, who is here. And anyone who would like to see, uh, we will just we can pass it around. Pass it around. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And it's a compilation of practices of so-called piracy of necessity in different parts of the globe. So we were investigating in China, in, in Brazil, in, um, in um, uh, Cuba, uh, and uh, it's, you, can, you can check it online. It's, uh, you can download it, download it if you're interested. And also Blacklist and um, other project that I will present a bit later on. And also we do artworks, site-specific projects, events, and performances. So this, this is one of the example. If it's predictive art bot, an algorithm then turns the latest media uh, headlines into artistic concepts. So we will also present it a little later. So the first part of this talk are um, uh, we will present uh, older artworks. 
Um, Artwork Switch tends to reveal some invisible digital infrastructures, and then um, we'll show a more recent project, and also we present the uh, the project we would like to work on here in Irvine. So Nicolas will present some of the projects. First project. Okay, so yeah, we basically for more than ten years uh, we've been interested in uh, the. the all the, the infrastructures of um, the digital uh, shift uh, is uh, somehow uh, invisibilized around us, so it's very hard to, uh, to make sense of uh, uh, the, the impact it has on us and also uh, the materiality of uh, uh, digital uh, infrastructures or uh, tools, but also uh, language. Um, uh, I will explain what what this project is about. So basically, data is physical in many ways. Uh, the, the production of hardware obviously is physical. Uh, the hard drive uh, you have on your computer, the servers, but also the, all the maintenance of the infrastructure is uh, uh, physical, obviously. Uh, but even at, at the microscopic level, at the level of the data bits, uh, it's also uh, uh, anything, um, sorry, it's also uh, purely physical. So uh, at the microscopic scale, uh, as you can see here, it's a magnetic uh, microscopy of an hard drive. Uh, you, you have uh, actual uh, uh, charges of uh, uh, magnetic uh, bits uh, that are uh, physically uh, present uh, on the hard drive, but that's most of the time we can't uh, see without uh, uh, a microscope. So we, we did this project um, in the early 2000s, which is basically a, a simple program that um, helps us to, to materialize or to get a sense of uh, the, uh, the data that surrounds us. So it's a program that simply uh, reads anything on, on an hard drive. It can be on a local hard drive or on a server, and sends the flow of data directly to the sound card and the graphic card of your computer. So it's, it's very simple. It's a, a low-level uh, sort of... Uh, uh, program, but it, it has a lot of interesting uh, qualities and uh, results. So basically, it materializes, uh, you know, like uh, through that you can uh, get a sense of the the compressions, the, the structures of the the, the files, uh, the types of file, the, the languages, uh, but also how they are organized on your drive and so on. So I will play a, a short uh, excerpt of this uh, first project. So basically, to, to read a, a full hard drive, it will take a few days. Uh, and uh, I mean, it gives all those uh, interesting quality because of the low-level interpretation. Uh, you know, most of it is uh, pretty much like noise. Uh, but uh, still, you, you get uh, this kind of uh, direct physical sense of uh, the logics and the structure of the, the data that we usually don't see in this kind of uh, low direct level because most of it is interpreted through uh, different programs and languages and so on. So the second aspect, um, which also investigates somehow the infrastructure of the internet, uh, looks at uh, the politics of uh, digital distances and words on the internet. Um, so in this project, um, we are looking at the latency online, and um, Basically, the fact that uh, the latency online is not so much related to physical distances, but more related to network topology. So basically, uh, the way that the cables um, have been organized, uh, the path that your uh, data exchanges will take, uh, the bit rate. Uh, so somehow, all those logics 
uh, creates a new, new sorts of geography, new, new sorts of distances, and obviously new power dynamics. Uh, most of those uh, um, submarine cables, for instance, are following the colonial path, the colonial routes. So it's somehow, the, at, at the end of the day, the, the way that your data will go from your computer to another distant computer uh, is not always the shortest route. And it's not always um, um, basically uh, related to physical distances, but rather to this um, physical topology. So the project uh, I will show now uh, basically um, uh, is a world map um, that uh, uses the, the ping command uh, to create a new sort of network geography that represents uh, network distances with player short pixel. Ping map is a world map that uses network access time as its unit of measure. Based on a simple ping command, this project measures the response time of the government websites for the 193 members of the United Nations in order to deduce their empirical distance on the network. Ping map invites us to reconsider the very notion of world cartography in the era of networked societies, hyperconnectivity, and high frequency trading. This is also a pretty old project, but um, uh, still it's a way to sense uh, or to materialize uh, logics that are usually hidden or hard to, to grasp. Um, the, the last example in this series of, uh, um, uh, is still investigating uh, internet infrastructure, uh, but here more about the, the consequences of the internet infrastructure on the data flow. So basically, uh, this project was a little bit against this idea that uh, network streams are linear, uh, continuous, transparent. You know, we often have this idea, for instance, if we uh, use a Skype or the streaming service, that uh, the flow of data is uh, this kind of um, continuous, uh, homogeneous uh, stream of uh, information. But it's, it's way more chaotic than that. Uh, basically, uh, the, the packets are sent on uh, the, the, the network uh, little bits by little bits, and each packet takes a route which is the, supposed as the best one at this uh, given moment. So all the packets are taking different routes, and uh, potentially some, some would be lost, some would be corrupted, uh, some would have to be sent again, uh, and as a as a client, you will receive the packets in a, uh, also in a chaotic order. It means that the packet number one might arrive after the packet number two. You might miss some packets that you will ask again and so on. So it's, it's way more material and way more, um, um, yeah, like um, way more organic than uh, we can imagine uh, as a usual uh, customer. So we wanted to, to sort of uh, visibilize this uh, dimension of the internet materiality with this project, which is a, uh, an early project that I did with a colleague of mine, Nicolas Montgermont, in, uh, early, in 2007. So basically, basically what's going on here is that a continuous tone um, sent uh, from a server in Japan uh, to the exhibition space. And then what you hear is uh, basically the, um, this continuous sound, which is decoded without any error correction uh, in the exhibition space. So basically, you remove all the usual error correction uh, that you normally have in a stream uh, exchanges. So uh, what you hear is the effect of the root of the, of the network on this continuous tone. And the visual is uh, just what's called a spectrogram. Uh, so it's a 3D spectrogram of uh, the sounds that have been created by the, uh, the transmission of this sound and the roots on the network. And the last project that kind of 
continue on this line of uh, thought and research, um, looks at uh, the flow of peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing online. So this project aims to, to offer an experience of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, uh, file sharing, um, and the logic of the packets as they are exchanged uh, between peers. I will start with a, a short video introduction. ...violate copyright laws, often without being aware that they're doing so. Detect when copyrighted content is being shared illegally. They can identify the internet protocol or IP address of the computer making the file available and the internet service provider or ISP that is associated with that address. The content owners notify the ISP, which then passes the information in an alert to its customer. Okay, so uh, file sharing uh, has been around um, since a long time and um, since the early 2000s basically it's been uh, highly popularized. Um, uh, because, for instance, of uh, BitTorrent, of um, also um, Pirate Bay, and um, what's interesting is that since the early days, uh, you already had a lot of surveillance going on. So this surveillance could be uh, uh, developed by uh, governments. Uh, it could be also developed by universities for statistical purpose, and uh, also for copyright copyright uh, infringement, uh, and. Basically, what we wanted to do with this project is to reverse um, the system of surveillance that uh, has been used uh, with, by all those um, uh, companies and um, entities, but use it not for uh, revealing uh, only the IP address or not for detecting who is uh, stealing what, but uh, to reveal the dynamics and the vitality of uh, those exchanges as they are happening. And more than that, uh, to reveal the content uh, of the packets and the materiality of uh, this new way of consuming uh, media online. So this project basically exposes the materiality of this process and the geographical dynamics uh, of the exchanges as they are going on. So I will also play a, a short um, video sample. <coughs> Geographical representation of the exchanges as they are going on, and you might wonder why uh, some packets are uh, 
uh, disrupted or um, got a lot of uh, glitches, they, it's actually the way that the packets are exchanged. So packets are exchanged in a uh, really like it's fragments of files, and they, not all of those fragments have the correct information to be uh, decoded properly. Okay, the next project will be presented by Maria. Yeah, it was already presented quickly in the beginning, the blacklist, so uh, it's a project about illicit content on the web and uh, the politics of search. Um, so we got uh, interested in who controls uh, and, um, and decides what should be visible online or not, <coughs> what should be blocked or not, uh, what are the rules, how these lists of undesirable contents are built and how uh, uh, are used and uh, how it, this is somehow revealing the value system we live in. Uh, it usually takes shape of a commercial list you can just buy, um, a commercial blacklist services, uh, there is some uh, companies doing it or universities. Um, in, uh, nowadays, um, the, the, this, can, this kind of list can be blocked, um, that can be blocked uh, are organized in categories, so if you are a system administrator, you can decide what kind of uh, contents you want to block. Um, so it can be used by uh, towns, universities, airports, <coughs> companies, private companies, individuals, uh, and so on. And it um, helps to uh, restrict the very specific content on, on their network. So, um, so there, are, there can be different kinds of things, like for example, here you can see Channelogy, so all the uh, websites like 4chan and 8chan. Uh, there is also f a feminist. Uh, feminism, uh, it reveals the commercial aspect of this list because you can, um, you can um, order, you can uh, demand the specific content to be blocked and then the company can uh, prepare the, the list of links to be block blocked. So um, we just uh, simply um, uh, organize these uh, this links in, um, in um, like, a, like a paper encyclopedia in, in a <coughs> alphabetic order, uh, 13 uh, books, and you can just uh, uh, look at it like a, uh, it's reading also kind of a poem because names are quite close from one from each other, so it's quite interesting to read it, to zoom in, and uh, it's a kind of ready-made uh, moral portrait of the web. Blacklists is a directory of the prohibitions of the internet, deployed in the form of an encyclopedia, in 13 volumes of 666 pages each. It is an extensive collection of restricted websites, used for the automatic filtering of traffic considered illicit or licentious. Just like the intent of forbidden libraries, the Blacklists project points out the sidelining of online content that could be dangerous for the very survival of the system. With around 2 million websites extracted from commercial content control softwares, this collection reveals a cultural, social and ideological model of our society through what has been deemed unfit for consultation by specific groups and institutions around the globe. project uh, is not anymore about infrastructure, but looks at um, algorithms and uh, the role it plays in uh, our contemporary um, social media and phones usage. Um, so I will contextualize it a little bit. Uh, in the era of uh, hyperconnectivity, uh, the time we spend on phones and social media has radically increased over the past uh, 10 years. And this has a very large effect on us. So online news and communication tends to monopolize a big part of our attention and has a growing influence on, on the types of concerns and priorities uh, that we have. So uh, <laughs> this has a, a wide range of effects. Uh, uh, some of those effects uh, are named like filter bubble or uh, media echo chambers. Those are effects of hyper consumption, hyper like um, uh, yeah, consumption of. Uh, phone and social media. To some extent, uh, the influence of social media tends toward a, a sort of uniformization, 
not only of our types of concerns, but also of our types of imagination and creativity. And somehow this is tending toward a higher chance of predictability of our behaviors. So we, we got interested in that, but also in the way that uh, it's also uh, similar in the art field. So within the arts, uh, we also started to notice a similar pattern <coughs> where uh, numerous uh, similar imaginary um, and trends uh, began to, to appear uh, clearly to us. Um, we started to observe similar topics, similar ideas, and similar ways of answering, reacting, and realizing artworks uh, in our kind of network. So many people uh, around us started, you know, in, in, in the same kind of time range to uh, pr produce uh, ideas for artworks that were very likewise or sometimes almost similar, right? Uh, so we started with a sort of uh, question, you know, like, uh, do we really need artists uh, that simply follow the trends? And uh, do we really need artists even to, uh, to illustrate the, the latest uh, technological buzz in a way? Um, so uh, this is where this project started, based on this simple question. And we, we decided somehow to, uh, to create a project around that and to automatize this process of mainstream creativity and somehow to push it toward the absurd. So to make sort of a, uh, a caricatural uh, version of uh, artistic creativity and their connection with social media. Uh, so we created a, a bot, so a program that is basically uh, subscribed to uh, hundreds of uh, uh, media outlets, journals, blogs, influencers. Um, it receives uh, the RSS feeds from those and looks at the headlines of the, the articles that they, they post. Um, then it, uh, it uses a little bit of machine learning uh, to identify what is supposed to be the uh, most important keyword in the headline. Uh, and based on those keywords, um, then it's, uh, it transforms the keyword into uh, sentences um, that are uh, organized to uh, look like uh, artistic concepts or artistic ideas. And using this very precarious and simple uh, system, we create sort of a machine or a small factory uh, to produce uh, real-time uh, ideas. So ideas on topics that are emerging right now. So sometimes, you know, the idea is already produced by this system as you even ha haven't uh, read the, the news yet, right? So it's this kind of, you know, um, short circuit in the ideation uh, or idea production uh, uh, system. Predictive art bot is an algorithm that turns the latest media headlines into artistic concepts. In the age of hyperconnectivity, the perverse implications of media echo chambers are becoming more and more obvious. Groups of similar behaviors are being partitioned in filter bubbles, while the few massively reposted topics tend to monopolize most of the available attention. Such insular echo chambers strongly affect ways of thinking, resulting in increasingly homogeneous imaginaries within groups of like-minded people. Predictive art bot caricatures the predictability of media-influenced artistic concepts, by automating and skirting the human creative process. But beyond mere automation, it aims to stimulate unbridled, counterintuitive and even disconcerting associations of ideas. To do so, it continually monitors emerging trends among the most influential news sources and fields as heterogeneous as politics, environment, innovation, culture, activism, or health. On this basis, it identifies and combines keywords to generate concepts of artworks in a fully automated way, ranging from unreasonable to prophetic through absurd. Each prediction becomes a thought experiment waiting to be incubated, misused, or appropriated by a human host. <laughs> okay, so, um... That's a bot uh, which is active 24-7, uh, so you can follow it uh, uh, here on predictiveartbot.com and 
It also posts uh, once a while on Twitter. Um, yep. So the next uh, project focuses on the infrastructure of uh, basically uh, user surveillance and profiling online, uh, which is also called surveillance capitalism. So under surveillance capitalism, the main econ economical model is the extraction and accumulation of data from users, but also from the physical world. You can think about uh, Google Street View, for instance, and the way that it uses and capitalizes on uh, the physical images of your city, in your house, and so on. So user profiling combines many layers of data. Uh, it can be data that are publicly available and scraped from, from the web. It can be your web searches, uh, visits, and other behaviors. It can be your activities on social media, uh, your user account, activities on your smartphone, application usage, online purchases, what you order uh, on Amazon and any other websites, uh, the activity of your smart TV or your uh, fitness tracker and so on. So this is an example of uh, the way that uh, uh, Facebook uh, creates uh, your user profile. <coughs> So Facebook is harvesting everything you do uh, on Facebook and outside of Facebook. Uh, and they sell this as a service. So basically it's a set of tools that are available for advertisers. And uh, it's also used by political influencers and uh, third parties like uh, Cambridge Analytica, for instance. So this tool uh, contains hundreds of um, uh, data points. Like here you see just a tiny bit of it. Uh, they can be about your behaviors, education, work, language, financial situation, <coughs> politics, incomes, and so on. Um, so uh, we were interested basically about how to reverse this process of surveillance um, and create a sort of a data collection about uh, the big tech companies, basically. So at this period, we started to work with a research lab in France that studies a complex system systems and uh, they were actually using a uh, Google page rank uh, at this time to, to extract uh, statistics and correlation um, inside uh, big data um, like uh, Wikipedia, human DNA and so on. So we started basically to, uh, to look in their tools and to uh, use them for that purpose to <coughs> basically use those tools uh, that were based on page rank, Google page rank to extract data profiles about uh, big tech companies. So we're exploiting the algorithm of Google PageRank basically to extract <coughs> big tech profiles. And Google PageRank is, um, is, is not s s so much of an anecdote. It's, a, it's an historical, uh, historically significant milestone in the sense that uh, it's an important event in um, the history of uh, surveillance capitalism <coughs> and also of uh, data collection. So Google started basically to download uh, the whole uh, web in uh, 95 at Stanford, and they used it uh, for uh, developing the search engine, but also for data mining of all sorts. So here is a, a short uh, presentation of that. So anyway, I started off by reversing the links, and then I wanted to find, you know, basically say, you know, who links to the Stanford homepage? And there's 10,000 people that link to Stanford, and then the question is, well, which ones do you show? So you can only show 10. You know, and we ended up with this way of ranking links um, based on the links. And then we were like, wow, this is really good. You know, it ranks things like, you know, the order you'd expect to see them. And Stanford would be first. You can take universities and just rank them. And they come out in the order you'd expect. Um, and so we thought, this is really interesting. You know, this thing really works. Um, we should use it for search. And so I started building a search engine. And, Sergey also came on very early, um, probably in late 95 or early 96, and started, was really interested in the data mining part. Yeah, so basically, um, we, we, we applied uh, this model of uh, uh, data extraction and uh, statistics, stat statistical analysis uh, of page rank on uh, different uh, uh, big tech companies. Um, so we ended up with, you know, statistics on different topics. So basically, uh, what we did is uh, uh, cross-checking companies in an important topic, social topic, that we're interested in, and to see what were the results. Basically, what were the statistical uh, results we, we could get from that. So at this moment, right now, it's really uh, raw statistics. 
But for this conference, we, we quickly uh, sort of sketched uh, visual animations to go with it and kind of illustrate it. So we'll just show a few uh, results of that. Amazon.com Inc. Philosophy ratio 50% Aristotelianism, 23% Hedonism, 15% Stoicism, 7% Cynicism, 3% Objectivism, and Rand. 0% Phenomenology, 0% Neoplatonism, 0% Rationalism, 0% Neo-Confucianism. Google, LLC, Political Ideologies, Ratio, 31% Neoliberalism, 25% Capitalism, 12% Globalism, 9% Libertarianism, 6% Distributism. 5% extremism, 4% industrialism, 4% communitarianism. <laughs> Apple, Inc. Types of addiction, ratio, 32% internet addiction disorder, 24% mobile phone overuse, 19% problem gambling, 13% computer addiction, 5% television addiction, 2% pornography addiction. 1% internet sex addiction, 1% compulsive buying disorder, 0% sexual addiction. Facebook, Inc. Types of colonialism, ratio, 35% neo-colonialism, 29% Americanization, 13% right to exist, 7% co-colonization, 5% cultural imperialism, 3% anti-imperialism, 2% cultural appropriation, 1% transculturation, 0% civilizing mission. <laughs> so in the Q&A, we can maybe explain a little bit the uh, technical background of it. Uh, it's a bit complex, but uh, basically it's a cross-checking, and then we just look at the statistical uh, uh, number of answer of those different um, uh, topics. Um, <coughs> yeah, so we will start uh, the presentation about uh, our curatorial uh, works. Uh, and Maria will present the first one, which is Shanghai Archaeology, that looks in a specific branch of technological innovation that emerged uh, from uh, uh, the Chinese area of Shenzhen. Yeah, so maybe I will go faster, uh, because we still have a lot to say. Uh, so just to introduce uh, quickly, um, with Shenzhen Archaeology is a collection of fonts we, um, from China. It's a collection <coughs> of hybrid fonts uh, are made in uh, 2000s until, until more or less now. Now it's uh, less and less uh, popular there. And it was a kind of a, um, a tribute also to Shenzhen culture, which is a mix of uh, piracy, DIY, and uh, anti-establishment. So um, Shanghai uh, means uh, mountain uh, fortress, literally, and it uh, first it refers to novel uh, uh, from the 13th century, the water margin. And then um, uh, this term uh, quickly was associate, uh, associated to manufacturing since 50s in Hong Kong to describe uh, small-scale uh, family-run uh, factories that produced uh, cheap items um, that uh, of country fed uh, fa famous brands like uh, uh, Dolce & Gabbana, Puma, and so on. So uh, this was really sold on the markets who will never bought the expensive originals. So it was not really a competition. It was just kind of new creativity. So um, uh, this, uh, this uh, manufacturing moved to Shenzhen in 2000s. And this uh, informal network of Shanghai uh, found a perfect product in a mobile phone. Uh, so uh, we started to collect them. Uh, the first object in our collection was Ghana phone. Uh, so this is like uh, not official names. We, we just named it that. This is Textigi model. Uh, we've been really intrigued uh, with uh, this uh, model because it was developed by Chinese uh, makers for uh, Ghanaian market. Um, it was uh, really a phone and power bank. Uh, you could uh, uh, charge other phone and devices from this phone. The battery lasts up uh, to a week, and also it comes with a, a lamp, a LED lamp that can uh, um, uh, um, help you while uh, power cuts in Ghana, which are quite frequent in Ghana. 
so we collected uh, hundreds of these phones. We, we have a few uh, exam examples here. And uh, we started with a simple protocol. Like we, we started to, uh, with collecting mainly hybrid phones combining different functions. Like for example, ele electric razor, or computer mouse phone, like this one, uh, or a lighter phone. We will, I will just f show a few of them. Um, one of the reasons also we focused on these phones is uh, that uh, <coughs> it's, uh, mm, it reveals an ob obvious and radical contrast with occidental, uh, western uh, technological imaginaries of the last 20 years, uh, like, uh, this, uh, like this kind of uh, phones. This project tends to remind us that other mm, technological uh, possibilities are also, can, can, be, can be there, always exist uh, beyond the, the ultra-normalized uh, normalized industry. So uh, why don't we just show a few, uh, because we have only four of them here. This is a lighter phone, uh, so you can uh, light a cigarette with it. Cigarette pack phone, uh, so um, it's a phone, but also you can put your cigarettes inside. And it also comes with a phone. A razor phone, so uh, just a razor. So this is a uh, card phone. Uh, it exists in different shapes. This one is wooden, for example. And it's uh, uh, the one, one of the cheapest on the market. Uh, it's called, in uh, 2014, it was about uh, twelve dollars. It's made so the uh, it made uh, it's made from a single board, and it's it can easily be uh, replicated. A Buddha phone. It's really um, um, a digital alternative for Buddhist prayer. So this looks like this. Uh, and it's related uh, to religious activities. So you can burn incense, for example, with it, or make a purification rites, or put some meditative music. So this was... Uh, <laughs> activities of, uh, of uh, the elderly in China. It's dancing in the public squares uh, sometimes in the evening. So um, this phone was made for them. Uh, it's a um, sound system phone. It comes with several uh, giga gigabits of uh, uh, songs. Um, it comes with big buttons, a powerful uh, sound system, and also uh, comes with torch, so when you go back home after the dancing, you can light this, the, the street uh, with it. It's small, nice and neat to put away. Can't move arms. Well, this is a prisoner phone. I'm proud of you, it's going to be Because they're available in most of the visit halls. You can't take something that might not be there because if you do, they're going to notice it different. I'd say that there's probably 75% of prisoners have phones in, in jail. I take that in on a person um, in places where you wouldn't get searched, the front of your trousers, in your bra. So you understood, it's, uh, uh, this, pop this phone is uh, popular um, uh, among prisoners because of its 99% uh, plastic structure. It's uh, barely detectable during uh, checks in prison and easily you can easily hide it uh, inside food, inside your body, or using drones, or career pigeons, or rats. So, yeah, we have more, uh, more of them, uh, but um, uh, we try to exhi exhibit these devices in their na natural habitats, so we build a reproduction of a 
street market kiosk where we showcase this collection of hybrid home phones. So uh, we have also some documentary about um, a larger Shanghai culture. And uh, the last project uh, quickly we present is the Museum of Radio. So yeah, this uh, <coughs> last curatorial project is a work in progress. <laughs> Uh, it's a working title, The Museum of Failures, and um, it's a project we, we've been developing uh, for many years as uh, workshops and research sessions. Uh, I will start with a, a quote by, uh, by Paul Zerillo. This acknowledgement of powerlessness before the upsurge of unexpected, catastrophic events forces us to reverse the usual trend which exposes us to accidents and inaugurate a new kind of museology and museography. One which consists in exposing or exhibiting the accident, all accidents, from the most commonplace to the most tragic, from natural catastrophes to industrial and scientific disasters, including also the kind that is too often neglected, the happy accident, the stroke of luck, the coup de foudre or even the coup de grace. So this quote uh, illustrates pretty well the starting point of this project. <clears throat> Our idea, so we were uh, continuing the, this flow of thought around uh, this innovation and the, and the critics of uh, the narrative of technological innovation. We are surrounded by every day uh, this kind of techno-positivist bias that uh, the media and uh, uh, companies have nowadays. And we were thinking that we need some, some sort of reparatory history or counter-history of technology. So we started this uh, basically uh, archive uh, of the counter stories of um, technological history, um, and basically by uh, you know like uh, uh, collecting sorry I will go this way uh, collecting uh, intentional failures, uh, dystopias, uh, disasters, uh, unexpected or unplanned outcomes of technology, uh, accidents of technology, but also like uh, uh, happy accidents. Uh, the, the long-term impact of technology and so on and so on. So the idea was really like to create this kind of patchwork, um, or it, not not a, a, like a, a totally uh, a fluent uh, or um, totalizing history, but more this kind of cut up uh, that kinds of give an, an, a larger understanding or maybe more nuances to our to our. Uh, perception of the history of technology and the, the place that technology has in our society. Um, so yeah, it takes the shape of uh, workshops, conferences, events. So here we can see one of the symbolic events we had, that uh, a groundbreaking uh, ceremony uh, to symbolically uh, start this, uh, this project. And um, the, the project will also take the, the shape of a, of a book, basically. It's a collection of uh, yeah, aborted projects, flops, errors, malfunction, business failures, ethical rejections, uh, disasters, and so on. Uh, yeah, and now we wanted to uh, introduce a little bit. Uh, yeah, we wanted to introduce the, the project we will uh, do here. Um, so, um, following all this track and this line of thought. Um, at the moment, we want to uh, continue on the, the critics of growth and uh, innovation uh, by exploring um, the idea of post-growth and, uh, as artists, how we can contribute to uh, uh, basically uh, building our imaginaries and our practices and prepare ourselves to an era of post-growth, basically. So, uh, Basically, um, uh, uh, one sec. Yep. Um, yeah, so the, the idea is pretty simple. Um, post growth uh, relies on this idea that on a finite planet uh, with finite resources, uh, the economies and the population cannot grow uh, indefinitely. Uh, so um, it is necessary to look for other indicators of growth than uh, GDP and maybe think about uh, human well-being or other sort of uh, uh, development and maybe uh, uh, social uh, uh, development rather than uh, economical ones. So post-growth seeks to identify and build on what is already working rather than focusing on what's not. 
And post growth advocates try to encourage, connect, and further develop already existing ideas, concepts, technology, systems, and so on. So uh, basically, uh, there are two books we can mention. Um, one is uh, The Limits to Growth, and the other is Prosperity Without Growth. Uh, basically, uh, the takeaway from this is uh, quite simple, is that we are reaching a turning point in the exploitation uh, capitalism model. Uh, so that's roughly where we are at the moment. And the idea is that growth, uh, in an economic sense, uh, is not anymore uh, an option. So as artists, we want to engage with that and contribute to uh, think about that. Um, it's uh, especially a problem if you think about uh, the impact of growth on uh, the environment. And it's not only a pure uh, leftist or eco-terrorist or anti-capitalist view uh, on the situation, right? It's uh, even the largest uh, insurance company are uh, uh, talking about it at the moment. So this is the Global Risk Report uh, that uh, just uh, has been released basically a few weeks ago. And you can see that uh, amongst the, uh, uh, the six uh, biggest uh, threats, um, you uh, all are uh, connected to uh, ecological or environmental uh, issues. Um, yeah, and uh, it can seem far from uh, digital concerns, uh, like especially in the uh, Department of Informatics here, uh, but actually around the globe people are concerned with that and even with the, the links uh, between uh, ecological concerns and digital concerns, uh, in the sense that uh, we need to change our digital infrastructure also to uh, render this change possible and to contribute basically uh, to uh, uh, give us the capacity to act. Um, or uh, you know, the, the opposite way we can see how digital infrastructure um, can contribute to uh, basically manipulate opinions and uh, uh, yeah, paralyze uh, actions. So what we like to do is to present a few uh, um, initiatives, projects, uh, writers, uh, artists that are uh, engaged with uh, those uh, line of reflections. So thinkers and writers uh, are engaged with this uh, way of rethinking uh, positive futures, values, practice, and imaginaries. Here we can see a movement that emerged in the last decade uh, called the Solar Punk. It's a movement more related to uh, writings. Uh, and there is also this uh, category of writings co called uh, climate fictions that tries to engage with uh, uh, positive futures uh, that embrace uh, this sort of uh, reality. Um, some very practical practices are also emerging to prepare ourselves to post-growth, uh, like here with a, <coughs> a simple act of preservation and distribution of uh, uh, raw or extinct uh, seeds or um, uh, non-official uh, uh, or non-industrial seeds. So here is a, a group called the Open Source uh, Seed Initiative. It's, uh, uh, I think, uh, around Seattle. Uh, artists are also exploring um, extreme environments uh, and try to, to think about extreme scenario uh, for uh, uh, food and um, uh, gastronomy, so this collective is called Genomic Gastronomy, and uh, during one of their re residency in Norway, um, they, they, they did try to uh, identify sources of food in uh, such uh, extreme uh, context. Um, you can also see, uh, like here, uh, the artists of uh, the collective Superflux uh, that are thinking about a post scarcity world. So this project is a, an anticipation project that is uh, situated in 2050 and tries to see in this post uh, scarcity um, and in a sort of a distrust of the in the food industry um, uh, apartments where people are starting to grow their own food uh, using uh, hydroponics or aquaponics uh, so here is a kind of a scenario of an indoor uh, sort of a food production uh, so it's called the mitigation of uh, shocks. Um, here, um, this, uh, it's an example by an, an artist, a chemist, 
uh, with Marie Magic, which is thinking about uh, a future or a present of uh, DIY production for contraceptive pills and for uh, hormones for trans people. So basically, the idea is that um, even using uh, uh, your own uh, water supply, uh, using uh, people urines, urine, uh, you you can uh, extract. Uh, the, the components uh, to produce contraceptive or uh, hormone supplements. So it's a sort of a DIY alternative, I, I would say. Um, researchers uh, are also uh, thinking about that uh, and how to, uh, uh, to, to produce counter histories of technology. So here uh, it's a full book that is uh, somehow excavating um, alternative uh, histories uh, related to energy production. So uh, this uh, researcher has been um, collecting uh, hundreds of uh, patents, inventions, and uh, prototypes uh, that uh, were forgotten by uh, history. Basically. Uh, so prototypes to, to produce, you know, like uh, uh, electric car uh, in the early uh, 20th century, <coughs> or here with a prototype to um, to have a solar powered uh, pr printing press, and hundreds of other anecdotes that are fascinating. Um, here it's the artist and researcher Chris De Decker. He's running this uh, fascinating magazine, low tech magazine, and uh, even for his own website, he has been developing a tutorial uh, for. Uh, basically powering your website uh, with uh, solar panels. So it's a website that uh, sometimes runs offline, you know, but uh, it's also a radical uh, sort of standpoint. And together with another Dutch artist, uh, they've been imagining uh, uh, what could be a human power plant. And basically uh, using, uh, uh, on the campus, uh, using the, the power of people uh, exercising, uh, so uh, it's basically a sport uh, facility uh, that uh, uses the energy of people to produce electricity. And here with the, um, the artist uh, Julian Oliver, that is somehow envisioning how um, cryptocurrency could be uh, mined using uh, wind energy and uh, used to, uh, to found uh, climate research. Um, but uh, not only artists and uh, researchers are doing stuff like uh, even at the, the, the scale of uh, cities and uh, you know like uh, local uh, uh, area planning. Uh, you can see an example here with uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, in around uh, 2007, they decided to, to ban uh, outdoor advertising. And um, this example is often uh, used to um, sort of to, to frame and to explain how we could uh, uh, start by simple decision uh, to fight against uh, the addiction of consumerism mm -hmm. and uh, that could be a pretty practical way to start. This other example, I like it a lot. Uh, it's uh, based on an ancient uh, Shiroki uh, tradition, which is basically this idea that uh, any uh, long-term and big decision need to be uh, fought uh, ahead uh, for seven generations. So if you have a decision to, to do that engage uh, the larger group, uh, you have to think what would be the effect of it after seven generations. And the last uh, <coughs> example uh, about this long-term uh, planning is with um, uh, basically a nuclear waste. And here you can see an example with uh, Onkalo. It's a, a long-term project to uh, bury uh, nuclear waste. Um, in Finland, and basically it's a project that uh, is designed for 100,000 of years. So it's something which is nearly impossible to, to think about. Well, um, so what we are um, looking for uh, during our research at UCI um, are the, the following uh, uh, subjects. So basically, we would like to meet and document activities and research in uh, the following fields, like post-growth and degrowth, uh, regenerative practices, uh, resilient infrastructures and technology, radical sustainability and circular economy, uh, works on repair, care, maintenance, 
also tools for basically uh, doing a serious uh, calculation of uh, carbon footprint, life cycle assessment and externalities, uh, and simulation tools for uh, macroeconomy, uh, world system dynamics, and so on. Um, yeah, so basically uh, we would love to talk with you and uh, have feedbacks or contacts um, to continue this uh, research. And um, yeah, we'll be pleased to answer your questions and discuss with you.